I welcome in Steve Robertson. Steve, I hope you're doing well. Welcome into the game here in Tuscaloosa. It's good to be back. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. I want to get you involved in a lot of different things, but uh, certainly I want to get your reaction uh, last week when we got the amended notice of allegations. You've been telling us for a couple of months that you thought that this was going to happen. Uh, give me your reaction when you when you hear the news. Well, number one, I was surprised that Ole Miss was uh, willing to kind of go ahead and, and put some of that information out there. Now, let me go ahead and say this, and I've tried to be as eloquent as I can be about this. They've put out what they want us to know. They have not put out the full document. They haven't put out the full scope of the of the allegations. And so I think it's best for everybody to kind of reserve judgment until we see that because I, I really believe that's kind of given us maybe, you know, a thirty thousand foot view of this thing rather than the the details. And I really believe once that's known and we really see which infractions comprise those allegations that it's gonna be very damning for the university. Do you think it's worse than what we know? Well, I think we probably have a, a, a good synopsis and probably have the greatest hit, but I think the devil is in the detail, and I believe that is what will be ultimately very embarrassing for that football staff. Steve, when you started following this and, you, and you've been on top of this case from day one, judging from when you started learning about this case, because I admitted to the audience, I thought it was bad initially, and, and I've always been one of those that I, th- I think at the end of the day it will cost Hugh Freeze his job. But as I was reading, even from that 30,000-foot view, as you said a couple of minutes ago, I think it's worse than what I originally thought it was. Well, it's worse than what I thought it was. And, and frankly, you know, I've talked to some of the particulars, you know, the principals in this whole thing, and I uh, had a chance to speak with some people who were interviewed throughout the process and people that had knowledge of, uh, you know, like the Wayne County ACT stuff. I mean, that's something that I was contacted about, you know, a few years back, and that was in the first the January 22nd notice of allegations, the, uh, the allegations of ACT fraud. And so that's something we've been hearing about for a while. And when you hear these things about pay for play and the allegations that a coach was uh, working in concert with some boosters and made some introductions, and there's, you know, then there's ACT fraud and academic fraud and the Ed Center stuff. And it really begins, you know, when you take a step back and look at it, you know, from, you know, maybe an objective point of view, this is something that really threatens the sanctity of our game, that pretty much in every possible way, you know, every one of the tenets of compliance has been violated by the University of Mississippi. In in your opinion, now just based on your opinion, should this or will this cost Hugh Freeze his job? I mean, my honest opinion is I don't think he has any business coaching in college football. Um, and the reason that I say that is either he is complicit in the wrongdoing or he is completely incompetent as a supervisor. And he has been charged uh, with one of the allegations that he was charged with, you know, that's basically a failure to supervise his staff. And one of the first head coaches in college football to be charged with that allegation. And so he's got, at some point, there's four guys on his staff or that have been on his staff that are now charged with a level one violation. That is basically the textbook definition of noncompliance. And then they said in their answer last week that, you know, he's got a strong record of compliance. Well, it, it, I'm sure he has the monthly, you know, checklist of preparedness meeting with those guys, and that's probably great. But the fact that you have four guys that work on your staff that are now named in a notice of allegations, I don't think that uh, the claims of being a great supervisor ring true. We are right now talking to Steve Robertson. He is from Scout.com, Gene's page, uh, which is the Scout website covering Mississippi State. Gene, we're in Tuscaloosa, but I can sort of see it from even my perspective here. How much is this going to turn into an Ole Miss-Mississippi State battle with this NCAA? Well, I don't know if that ever goes away. You know, and and the fact that – there are some Mississippi State players that allegedly that uh, are named in that notice of allegations as witnesses. And there's also an Auburn player, and you know, and there are some other particulars in here. There's a, you know, a young lady that's actually a graduate from the University of Mississippi that's rumored to be a witness that uh, works at the University of Florida. That hadn't been confirmed yet. But so there's some other problems out there, even some you know, recruiting uh, battles between Alabama and Ole Miss that people kind of raise their eyebrows at it. But if you notice, that the only players who have really been mentioned uh, by the Ole Miss media and some of our regional media are Mississippi State guys. Nobody's really dug into that. And so I think, you know, of course, it's just my opinion, 
you know, I think that's leaked on purpose. I think that's the kind of fan the flames. It's, it's almost like, well, yeah, we cheated and it all looked truly bad and we misled everybody, but man, look at those dead gum bulldogs. Those bulldogs got us in trouble again. And that, that's kind of the appearance from this side of the I expect some retaliation, certainly, uh, but I think this is just kind of par for the course. It's just one of those things that you kind of deal with with an in-state rivalry. You know, one of the things, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, now please correct me if I'm wrong because I don't want to be mistaken on this, uh, but did the player that allegedly received this money as far as that never ended up at Ole Miss, did he end up at Mississippi State? He, he did. Okay. Well, to me, that that was one of those that just was a head-scratcher for me when I look at that type of allegation. Uh, to, if you're handing out that type of money prior to – uh, even getting an official commitment, or did he ever commit, or, or I mean, was this money just given to him for visiting? I mean, how, how did the money allegedly come up? Well, he's actually a former Alabama commitment, and then he was a long time on this commitment, and then ultimately signed on with Mississippi State. And so, you know, it, it's interesting that uh, I, I'm a guy that's kind of followed NCAA enforcement for a long time, and I became kind of an interest to find back in the early 2000s when. Uh, when Jackie Sherrill was investigated, and I just didn't feel like that the penalties were commensurate with the allegations. And you go back and you look and begin to kind of piece these things together. But in that case, the witnesses against Mississippi State were Doug Buckles, who signed with Ole Miss, uh, Stephen Peterman, who signed with LSU, Keyshawn Fudge, who signed with the University of Tennessee, JoJo Scott, who signed with the University of Southern Mississippi, Ken Griffith, who signed with the University of Mississippi. So this is not new territory. This is not a situation where players from opposing programs are, are now setting a precedent. And you know, that, that was the big talk about the immunity part of it, where they're given immunity. And what we were told is that in this situation, there were some guys who, there was some credible evidence uncovered through other testimonies that suggested that they were offered or accepted impermissible benefits from Ole Miss boosters. And the only way to get to that was to offer immunity. The only way to get the player to admit it was to offer him limited immunity. And that grant of immunity can only be revoked if you're dishonest with investigators. And so this is not a new practice, but in this situation, I think it really is indicative of how determined the NCAA enforcement staff was to get to the bottom of the illness case. Now, when you look at the NCAA, how much of their reputation is on the line here that that enforcement staff still exists uh, going after Ole Miss? I mean, with this much public, they cannot fall on this case. They've got to be able to punish Ole Miss to at least say that they've still got, you know, it's sort of like Barney Fife with a radar gun. I mean, you know, that they've still got some kind of power of enforcement. How much of the reputation of the NCAA is on line, uh, in your opinion, in this case? Well, I think a lot because this is really the first major infractions case under the new penalty matrix that was uh, instituted in 2013. And so as a result, this is a precedent-setting case. And so I really believe in this situation they have to really follow the letter of the law. One of the reasons that we have a new penalty matrix is because of the fact they wanted to really take the arbitrary nature of the process out of the committee on infractions, uh, deliberations, and things like that. It's kind of a plug-and-play thing. If you do this, then you're guilty of this, and here's your punishment. And so, because of this is the first case to really go through this process for football, I think they have to really follow the letter of the law. I don't think there's a lot of wiggle room there. And I think in many respects that's bad for Ole Miss because I think they would probably ideally like to fire some people and probably change some things up and show that they're repentant. But I just don't know that that helps because of the fact that this being the first case under the state penalty structure. Steve, if this structure or if these penalties come down, I, and I'm looking at it just from from my perspective here with Ole Miss. Uh, they've got this sort of arrogant attitude. I always say it's Alabama arrogance with Vanderbilt's trophy cabinet. Uh, to me, that's what happens in Oxford, Mississippi. Uh, when I look at the, the penalty structure, if the NCAA does bring the hammer, to me this is a program-changing NCAA. Uh, do you see Ole Miss recovering from this 10, 15 years out? Well, you know, I think so, and I don't think we'll ever see another death penalty type case, especially with, you know, Ole Miss not falling in the repeat by a later window. I think if there ever is a case like that, you know, if said for an example, if Ole Miss is right back before the committee on infractions two or three years from now, you know, I think anything's possible, especially as egregious as this case is. But 
<laughs> I think this is something that's not going to be a situation that Hugh Freeze can walk away from. I, I, I think this is a career-defining moment for him, and I think this is really a situation where Ole Miss is staring down the barrel of a loaded gun. Uh, there have been so there's a national perception out there that the SEC that everybody keeps and they're able to best to do it with impunity and that nobody's ever held accountable. And with Greg Sankey now taking over as commissioner, I mean, there's you know some new changes in the enforcement staff I and mean, the way that we kind of police the game now. Uh, I think that is an absolute nightmare scenario for Ole Miss just because of the fact that they're going to be the guinea pig for a process that's trying to prove that it has some real teeth again. As I look at Mississippi State, I know this is a quickly transition, mm-hmm. but I'd love to get your thoughts on spring football. They return 13 starters, uh, seven on the offensive side of the football. They get their quarterback, six defenders back. What do you expect from the dogs here uh, coming up in spring practice? Yeah, you know, we're number one. You know who the quarterback is, and that was really something that took State some time to kind of figure out. You know, Dak Prescott moving on to the National Football League, and there was an open quarterback competition, even though Nick Fitzgerald was kind of considered a front runner coming in. And I believe allowing that to linger into the season really hurt Mississippi State, and I think it, in some situations, may have divided locker room some, and I think that's why you saw what you saw against South Alabama. And it, it took some time for Nick Fitzgerald to kind of become the leader, and I really think that happened in Tuscaloosa, even in that loss. I think the fact that he took so many shots and kept getting up and kept trying to lead the team, I believe they began to really rally around him. We set up for you know, a nice stretch run in the month of November, and, and uh, you find yourself in a ball game, and, and you win that game, you beat Ole Miss by five touchdowns on their home field, and then you go down and you get a bowl win. So there's a lot of excitement right now because, you know, State's won three of five, and you know who your quarterback is. But, you know, Todd Grantham's here now as a defensive coordinator, and that was really kind of the Achilles heel for the Bulldogs last year. Uh, Dan Mullen knows how to score some points and move the chains, and now I believe he's got a defensive coordinator uh, that can bring a great defense. And that's the thing that's really hurt under Mullen's tenure here at Mississippi State. They've never really had a great defense. You've had a couple pretty good ones, but you've never had one that you just were excited to see play. It was just kind of hoping for the best and hoping you can get off the field and get that press guy back out there. And so I think with Grantham here and uh, Ron English now coaching up the secondary, I think that's a big part of things. And I, we, we're expecting another bowl year, and we think they'll be a pretty good team this year, but we really believe that 2018 could be a, another great year in Starkville. Steve, uh, when does spring practice start there in Starkville? We begin on Thursday, and uh, I don't know how much access we'll have. I mean, to kind of get back to all this stuff a bit, with all of this going on, you know, there's been some reaction from state players on social media because they've had some Ole Miss fans that have kind of reached out and attacked some of the players that they believe were involved in the investigation. And so I, I think it'll be pretty restricted. I don't know if we'll have a lot of access to certain players just because of the fact they want to protect the players. They're not really fan the flame uh, on social media. I'm, I'm curious. Um, I, I, I always hate to ask uh, other writers about other articles, but uh, this involves the SEC. Stuart Mandel wrote a really great piece on FoxSports.com, Four Reasons Why the SEC is No Longer the King of College Football. I'm curious if you've had a chance to to, to look at that. Let me ask you in a, in a generic way, uh, do you think the SEC has slid a little bit down uh, from where their national dominance was? Well, I think we're still strong at the top. You know, I think where we've, where we've been bad the last couple of years is the bottom half of the league just hadn't been you know, quite as competitive nationally as we should be. And I think the non-conference correct schedule reflects that. You know, I think this past year it was kind of Alabama and then everybody else. And I, and I really don't know that the rest of the league compared to Alabama, you know, for, for that stretch run. But, uh, you know, that said, I, I think last year was kind of a transition year because you had so many new quarterbacks in the league. And my hope is that with so many guys coming back as incumbent starters, it will be a lot better this year uh, collectively. But, you know, that's, a lot of that comes because I think it's quick bait. I think people have been, you know, every year they say this is the year that SEC falls down, and they, they repeat that every year, and at some point they're going to be right. But, you know, by and large, I think when it's all said and done, the SEC will still reign supreme. Whether they win a national, national championship this year remains to be seen. But uh, I think that's just popular off-season fodder to come out and declare the SEC dead again. Well, and, and, and Steve, we did it here tying it to a sort of ranking the top three coaches, and we've done this a couple different times. Uh, Dan Mullen's name comes up quite often in the fans who call our program when we talk about top three. Now, obviously, Nick Saban's at number one. The the, the big debate is two and three. Uh, do you think that's fair? I mean, is Dan Mullen in that top three when you look at SEC coaches right now? 
Well, I think when you, if you look at what he's done at a school that traditionally is a middle of the road program at best in this league, and I think every year there's a game out there that he's going to win that he's not expected to. And, and, and look at, look at number one in the country for five straight weeks back in 14 with a quarterback that really nobody else wanted. And so I think he gets a lot of mileage out of the fact that he can find quarterbacks that fit his system and then win ball games with them. And I think in order for him to kind of get to that next tier where he, it's not a question mark if he's number three or whatever, to get an exclamation point, is to show up the defensive side of the football and, and win some games. And Alabama's the only team in the league he had defeated as a head coach, and that's something that I think he's got to have to get off his back to.